Uh, good evening, I'm Matthew Spaulding. I'm the Associate Vice President and Dean of Educational Programming for Hillsdale College uh, here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Alan P. Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship, or BCHE, we like to say, here in, in uh, the nation's capital, where we try as best we can uh, to teach uh, those involved in public policy about something called the Constitution. Uh, uh, we, 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 we actually do, do um, better than one might think, but it's an uphill battle, shall we say. But I always like to point out that if you're going to convert people, you must go to where the sinners are. Um, I'm very happy this evening to have a friend of the college and a friend of mine here speaking to us uh, uh, about a subject which we at college are very interested in, uh, about uh, some in the political spectrum are using the mechanism of government to suppress things like free speech and free association, which are not only at the heart about what we teach, but at the heart of what we do. Um, and we all know what's going on in college campuses all over, all over the country. Uh, luckily, not Hillsdale. Um, so we're very happy to have her, uh, have her here. Um, our tradition at these events is to have one of our students introduce uh, our speakers who are going to do that tonight. He's currently here on the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program, uh, which is just finishing up. Uh, we currently have 25 students uh, here in Washington, D.C., interning around the city in different places, uh, political and otherwise, um, and also taking course at the same time. Uh, and he's currently subjected to a course by me. <laughs> I'll make no comment about that because he's, uh, he's turned in his final paper, but I've not read it yet. So, uh, so, so be careful with your words. Um, uh, Rosie Lane is a uh, junior at Hillsdale College, currently majoring in, he's majoring in politics and history. Uh, he's involved in the Student Federation, mock trial, uh, baseball, the presence, uh, and the resident assistance team. Uh, and he's currently a policy intern at the House Armed Services Committee, and he's just been elected very recently senior class president when he goes back to college. Uh, <laughs> that's what happens. They go to Washington, D.C., they really get involved in politics, run for office. Uh, but, but a good student. Uh, glad to have him here introducing our guest this evening. Dr. Spaulding for that fine introduction. So good evening, and on behalf of all of us here at Hillsdale College, and particularly on behalf of the class of 2018, it is my honor and distinct privilege to be with you here this evening in our Allen D. Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship here in America's capital. So I have the privilege tonight to introduce you to our distinguished speaker, Ms. Kimberly A. Strassel. Kim Strassel studied public policy and international affairs at Princeton University. Upon her graduation in 1994, she immediately took a position with the Wall Street Journal, where she worked in Brussels and subsequently in London. She moved to New York in 1999 and thereafter joined the journal's editorial page, where she started as a features editor. Ms. Strassel became the senior editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal in 2005 and is presently known for her weekly column, The Potomac Watch, which she writes for, from her base here in Washington, D.C. A 2014 Bradley Prize recipient, Ms. Strassel was a regular contributor to Sunday political shows including the following, CBS Face the Nation, Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace, and NBC's Meet the Press. She is also the author of The Intimidation Game, How the Left is Silencing Free Speech, which is the topic of her presentation this evening for us. It is now my distinct honor to present to you our guest this evening, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Kimberly Strassel. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming out here tonight, and thank you to Rosie for such a wonderful introduction. There's something incredibly humbling about knowing that there's a 19 year old that speaks better than you at age 19. <laughs> think of the places he will go. Um, and before I talk about the subject of tonight's speech, I just a, a quick word about Hillsdale College and how honored I am to be asked to come here tonight. I love Hillsdale College, it is a national treasure. One of the most uh, best experiences of my life, a couple of years ago, I got asked to go out and teach a very brief two-week course on editorial writing out there. Smartest kids I had ever seen in my life. 
one of the greatest programs in the country. And so again, it's a, just an honor to be here and be allowed to be briefly part of the Hillsdale experience. I always like to introduce this topic of free speech with a little story about my children. So for you parents out there, you will understand, maybe even get a laugh. For those of you who don't have kids yet, it'll be a, an indication of what you have to look forward to. I have three kids, they are age 12, nine, and five, and they are your average, normal, everyday kids, which means that they exist to annoy the heck out of each other. This is why they are on the earth. Back in the fall, we were all sitting around the dinner table, we always have dinner together every night, and the 12-year-old was doing a particularly good job of this with his five-year-old sister. And she finally grew so frustrated with him that she turned to him and she said, Oliver, you need to stop talking forever. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this inspired a volley of complaints and shouting and children yelling, you shut up, no, you shut up. And mom, who was desperate to stop the fighting and restore some order, said, I I've got an idea. How about we all go around the table and you can each take turns and you can tell me what you think the definition of free speech is. So we go around the table, and the 12-year-old goes first, and he's my very serious and academic child. And of course, he gave this textbook definition of free speech that involved reciting Congress shall make no law, and descriptions of James Madison, and a tutorial on the Bill of Rights, and warnings about certain exceptions for safety, public safety, and my health. And I was very happy to know that my private school fees are working out for me. <laughs> And the nine-year-old went next, and she's my rebel, she's the middle child, she's convinced that nobody ever pays attention to her, nobody listens to her, so she informed us that she had no idea what public safety or libel was, but that it didn't matter because free speech means that there should never be any restrictions on anybody uh, saying anything, anytime, anywhere, you should be able to say whatever you want, no matter the circumstances, and she added, by the way, we should all start by paying more attention to what she has to say. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, it's the five-year-old's turn, and she has been watching all of this very avidly, and you can tell thinking very hard about what she's going to say, and she finally fixes her brother and sister with a very serious stare, and she says, free speech is that you can say what you want as long as I like. <laughs> and you know what's funny as a parent, sometimes as parents you have those moments where it all falls into place. And I looked at my kids and I realized my oldest child was a constitutional conservative. And my middle child was a libertarian. And my youngest child was a socialist with a college. <laughs> <laughs> Which has actually been the case since she was born, so it shouldn't have been a surprise. But <laughs> I think the bigger point, and the reason I like to tell this story, is because what we have experienced over the past decade is a, a profound shift in our political culture, which has resulted in a significant portion of our body politic holding a five-year-old's definition of free speech. You can say it if I like it, if I agree with it. And what makes this shift really notable, at least to me, is that unlike many changes in politics, you can actually trace it back to one day. Most times in politics, things happen slowly. You don't really know when they happen. But in this case, it is one day. And that day is January 21st, 2010. And that's the day that the Supreme Court issued its Citizens United ruling and restored the free speech rights of millions of Americans. Now, for nearly 100 years up to that point, both sides of the political aisle had used campaign finance laws. And by the way, I like to call them speech laws because that's what they are. But they'd used speech laws to muzzle their political opponents. And both sides of the political aisle did it. The right did it, they used them to push unions out of elections. The left did it, they used them to push corporations out of elections. And they built up these laws and built up these laws until we got the Mac Daddy of all campaign finance and speech restrictions, which was the McCain-Feingold Act. And that ended up ultimately going to the Supreme Court. And the court said, you know what? You have gone too far. You have violated the Constitution. And five justices ruled that Congress, uh, again, had gone too far and they decided that they were going to restore the free speech rights of millions of Americans. And that's what came out of the Citizens United decision. Now, 
this ruling was viewed very differently on different sides of the aisle. On the right, by this point, they've got a bit of a religion on free speech and the fact that these campaign finance laws were problematic from their views as constitutional conservatives. So they viewed this ruling as a triumph, as a blow for freedom uh, and generally a good thing for society. It was viewed as an unmitigated disaster by the left because over the decades as the left had found it harder and harder to win policy arguments, it had come to rely more and more on these laws to simply push its political opponents out of the free speech arena. And yet here was the Supreme Court knocking back all of those laws, reopening the floodgates for nonprofits and corporations and many others to again speak freely in the public and electoral arena. And you have to remember the political moment at the time because that played into their reaction as well. This was 2010. Democrats were experiencing already an enormous backlash from many of the policies and the agenda of then President Barack Obama. There were revolts over the auto bailouts and stimulus spending and Obamacare. The Tea Party movement was suddenly in full swing and vowing to use the midterm elections that year to affect a dramatic change in Washington. Democrats feared, rightfully so, that an enormous electoral tidal wave was going to sweep them out of Congress and potentially even out of the White House in two years' time. And here was the Supreme Court saying, we're going to let all of your opponents go speak freely in this election. So in the days that followed the ruling, and you can actually go and trace this, and I do in the book, the left, the political left panicked, and they actually had a public debate about what they should do. And you can trace it. And they ultimately decided on a new strategy. And that strategy was this. If they could no longer use the law to bar their opponents from speaking in elections, they would do the next best thing. They would threaten and harass and intimidate them out of participating. They'd send a message. If you choose to exercise the rights that the court has now restored to you, you will pay a political and a personal price for doing so. <clears throat> And we've seen that strategy unfold ever since and in a variety of different tactics and in a very coordinated fashion. The people who are engaged in this tend to be the same groups again and again. They actually have meetings in which they discuss what they're gonna do, come up with new strategies, come up with new targets. None of this is coincidental or random. This is very much uh, part of the new playbook by the political left. One of those tactics that we see out there is the training of federal and state bureaucracies on political opponents. And of course, the best example we have of this is the IRS targeting of conservative nonprofits. To this day, if you talk to Obama officials, if you talk to Senate Democrats, they will continue to claim that this was just a couple of employees out in the Cincinnati Bureau of the IRS, and they didn't understand the law, and it was just a boneheaded error. That was the word the president actually used on national television. This was just a boneheaded error. I will tell you, and I don't use this word lightly, that is a lie. We have had several investigations in Congress, both in the Senate and in the House, and we know generally what happened. We don't have all the records we need, but we have everything we do need to piece together a very credible story about what was going on here. And here is what was going on. The Supreme Court issued its Citizens United ruling. The political left became very concerned, and they thought, aha, we can get the IRS to shut down some of these people for us. You have, in the months leading up to when this targeting happened, uh, and when the midterms happened, uh, Democratic senators sending letters left and right to the IRS, asking them to target the very groups that the IRS ended up targeting. You had the president out on the stump almost every day supporting different Democratic candidates for Congress, saying the same thing at every single stop, saying, look, thanks to Citizens United, we have all these shadowy, scary groups who are rushing into the election. You don't know who they are. They might be being operated illegally. They might be funded by foreign organizations. He knew that they weren't. It was a Tea Party. It was groups like Americans for Prosperity. But basically what he was doing was blowing a dog whistle to the IRS bureaucracy, asking them to step in and do something about it. Because remember, again, not only had Citizens United unleashed these floodgates, but Democrats were very frustrated that the Federal Election Commission wouldn't step in and do anything about this either. 
So what do you do? You turn to the bureaucracy. And by the way, that bureaucracy was highly aware of this whole political discussion and primed to act. Lois Lerner, we know from her emails, uh, this was one of her top priorities there. She disliked the idea of nonprofits operating in elections. And she ended up directing, after the very first day that the first two party groups were flagged out in Cincinnati, this entire operation moved to Washington. It was run by the higher ups in DC. And they ended up segregating out and targeting some 400 different conservative nonprofit groups representing tens of thousands of Americans and effectively silenced them during elections. They couldn't get their nonprofit status. They couldn't get donors to give them money. They couldn't get people to run their ads. They had no legitimacy. Many of them gave up on the project because it was just too hard to deal with an IRS. It was sending them letters suggesting that they could go to jail if they weren't filling out all their paperwork properly. We know too, by the way, I, I think that there can be no misunderstanding that this was done deliberately and it was done politically. We know that senior members of the Treasury Department, and this too came out of investigations, were aware in early 2012 what was going on and took steps to try to change what was happening because they knew it was a political liability. And yet they very deliberately kept that information from Congress for the entire rest of 2012 so that these groups also wouldn't have operational status during the presidential election either. So again, this was people who were attempting to get a bureaucracy to go after their opponents, and they did so very successfully. This is one of the most egregious abuses of government power that we have on the books in the history of this country. Another tactic that we see out there, prosecutors who abuse their awesome powers to hound and frighten their political opponents. We've got another good example of this. One of the more terrifying examples I have in my book, and it's what happened up in Wisconsin in the John Doe probe. Raise your hand if you've even heard this story about Wisconsin. It is astonishing to me that there are people who haven't heard this because this is just, it's egregious. What you had up there, Democratic prosecutors in Milwaukee launched a, a bogus criminal, by the way, I stress the word criminal, campaign finance investigation into about 30 different conservative groups who had supported the government reforms of former go or Governor Scott Walker. Wisconsin had a law on the books called the John Doe Law that allowed these prosecutors to conduct this investigation in secret. And the people who were the targets of this investigation were subject to a gag order, so they were not allowed to tell anybody that they were the subject of investigations. They had their finance records taken and looked through, their emails filtered through, their voicemails taken. There was even raids conducted on several of their homes. In one case, one of the targets of this investigation, he and his wife were on a charitable fundraising trip. While they were gone, their teenage son was left at home. Law enforcement came in in the early morning, banged in through the door, sequestered him in a room, would not allow him to call an attorney, would not allow him to call his grandparents who lived down the road, rifled the house, hauled away a whole bunch of computer equipment, and at the end, as they walked out the door, said, if you tell anyone what happened to you, you can go to jail. We only know that all of this happened because one of the targets of that investigation, a very brave man named Eric O'Keefe, ended up coming to the Wall Street Journal and telling his story. We ended up running a number of editorials about it and became national news in the end. But it ultimately took a lawsuit to stop this probe. He launched a lawsuit that went all the way up to the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, which shut this probe down. And in doing so in their ruling, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but they have a line in their ruling in which they said, the prosecutors in this case have invented theories of law in order to go after citizens who are wholly innocent of wrongdoing. So this was the highest court in the state of Wisconsin essentially saying in a legalistic way that the prosecutors in this case had ginned up this investigation entirely to frighten and scare their political opponents out of taking part in an election environment. And the message, again, was from those prosecutors, if you dare to speak, we will turn your lives into living hells, and we will potentially even put you in prison. We've had a, a more recent example of this in the 17 liberal attorneys general across the state that are now launching a probe into Exxon and some 100 different conservative groups that have worked with Exxon over the years. These 
prosecutors are actually suggesting that they might bring a racketeering suit against Exxon for the so-called crime of thinking the wrong way on climate change. Uh, we have some cross-litigation going on at the point, and some of these AGs have now dropped out of the suit. But again, this is a tactic that's catching on across the country among certain prosecutors. You use your power to silence your opponents. Another tactic we see out there is sinking activist groups on corporations and free market groups and using blackmail to try to silence their speech. One subject to such attacks, and I talk about it in the book, is a group called the American Legislative Exchange Council. This is an extraordinary group. They work to develop a free market policy uh, on a, a model basis and spread it from legislature to legislature at state level. Uh, it's a nonprofit. It's largely funded by corporate donations. It's wildly successful, so it has long been the target of many on the political left. But those groups, once the intimidation game started, came up with a new way of going after Alec. And what they did is, in the wake of the very tragic shooting in 2012 of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin in Florida, they came across the fact that Alec had had a minor role in helping to spread that model legislation, the stand your ground laws across different states uh, that ended up being the legal defense that the man in Florida used in that shooting case. Uh, Left-wing activists seized on this. They branded Alec a racist organization for having promoted those standard ground laws. And in the aftermath of the shooting, they targeted all of its corporate donors. They threatened to run ad campaigns branding each of those corporate donors as racist organizations, too, unless they stopped funding Alec. In a coordinated action, uh, Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, a Democrat, sent letters to a thousand organizations across the country demanding to know if they supported Alec, demanding to know if they supported Alec's racist policies, and threatening to hold them up in front of Congress if they said yes. Now, Alec lost nearly half of its donors in the space of a few months. And we see tactics like this being replicated against free market organizations across the country. And by the way, we see these tactics, it's important for people to know they're not just leveled at big organizations, they're not just leveled at politicians, they're leveled at absolutely ordinary Americans who engage in politics. One such person who I write about in the book was a man named uh, Frank Andersloop. He's an Idaho businessman. Uh, back in 2012, he gave a sizable donation to a super PAC that was supporting Mitt Romney. A couple of days after uh, the campaign finance records came out and left, found out that he had given this money, the campaign website for President Obama's re-election personally called him out, put his name up on the website, uh, and suggested that he was a criminal, a crook, a bad man. Uh, they were trying to smear Romney donors and they swept him into this net. <clears throat> Not long after that outing, Mr. Vandersloot was audited by the IRS. Not once, but <coughs> twice. He was visited by the Department of Agriculture. He was visited by the Department of Labor. This is a man who never had any interaction with the federal government prior to the President of the United States listing his name on a website. And as he said later when he came out, he said, this was the most powerful person in the world putting a target on my back, asking people to come after me. We see it against average Americans out in California back, some of you may remember the Prop 8 campaign in California. Uh, that ballot initiative supported traditional, mar uh, a traditional marriage. Many Americans, many Californians gave money in support of that ballot initiative. Activists who were opposed to that initiative combed through campaign finance records and got the names of everybody who had donated money in favor of Prop 8, their names and their addresses. They put those names and addresses on a searchable, walkable map so that they could go home to home and intimidate those who had given money. The people who had their names on this list had their cars keyed, their windows broken, they had their small businesses flash mobbed by protesters, their voicemails and emails were flooded with threats and insults. Some of them actually even lost their job, the most famous person being Brendan Ike of Mozilla. There were a number of people in addition to him that were no longer employed after this episode. And I think one of the things that was really depressing to me, in later depositions, people were interviewed about this, and almost to a last, everyone who was targeted on that list and had something unfortunate happen to them, 
said that if they were ever asked to give money again to a ballot initiative, they wouldn't do it, which is, of course, the other side winning in that campaign. One thing that all of these attacks, in fact, do have in common, and it's something we all need to think about a lot more deeply, is disclosure. Uh, we in this country have come to associate transparency and disclosure with good government. But the unfortunate reality is that our system of disclosure has been turned on its head. Disclosure is supposed to be a way for average citizens to keep track of their government and what's happening in their government. Anybody, I think, who followed the Hillary Clinton private server escapade over the last year will know that, in fact, government has become very, very good at hiding its records for the people and not letting information out that they would rather not have out. Instead, as a result, disclosure has instead increasingly become a tool by which government and political activists keep track of their opponents. And sadly, our federal judiciary has refused to honor some important precedents that protect anonymity in politics. One of the most notable Supreme Court cases we have is one called NAACP versus Alabama. And the history of this is worth everybody knowing. It was a civil rights era. There was an attorney general in Alabama who was very unhappy with the NAACP. The NAACP had just got involved with the Montgomery bus boycott, was generally causing a lot of problems for the Jim Crow government of Alabama. They were not happy, and so they ginned up a sort of bogus suit in which they claimed that the NAACP wasn't appropriately incorporated in the state. But then, and this was the revealing part, they went to the judge and they said that one of the remedies that they wanted was for the NAACP to have to turn over to them a list of every one of their members in Alabama. And the NAACP understood that they didn't want this list because the Alabama AG wanted to send them thank you notes. <laughs> they wanted it and they would, had they handed it over, it would have been catamount probably to a death list. The idea was to get these names, you would be able to harass people out of their jobs, to perhaps enact violence on them. Remember, this was a time in which there were still shootings and fire bombings. It was a violent error. The NAACP understood just how important this was. They fought this case all the way up to the Supreme Court, and a unanimous Supreme Court issued a ruling that broke new grounds in the First Amendment. It said, not only do you have a right to free speech, not only do you have a right to freedom of association, but sometimes, in order to exercise those first two things, you need to have anonymity in politics. And the Supreme Court actually backed up that decision with a number of follow-on ones throughout the 50s and the 60s, uh, right up until the 1970s and Watergate. And that's when we got our first campaign finance laws and our first disclosure laws, and the court decided that it would be better for it to get on board with the disclosure train. And what's interesting is it's never actually squared that circle. It still claims that it believes in NAACP versus Alabama, uh, and that somehow this is consistent with all the disclosure laws that we have out there. The court's ruling, when it first dealt with the aftermath of the Federal Election Campaign Act uh, at Buckley v. Vallejo, which was its, its major first decision on campaign finance laws, it said, don't worry, if anybody out there in the country feels threatened, you can just come to this court and we will grant you relief. Well, that might have been possible back in the days when campaign finance records were all stole, stored in kind of dusty boxes at the bottom of the Federal Election Commission, but these days, the minute you make a donation, your name goes online and your address. There is no time for the court to offer you relief, and this has become a growing problem. We've had some justices that have noted the problems, in particular Clarence Thomas. Uh, I think that we're gonna have more cases that come up to it that's gonna force it to have to deal with some of these inconsistency in the law. But so far, this is not something that has been a priority for the court, and so it's up to all of us to think a little bit more deeply about some of these disclosure laws and what they mean. What else can we do about all of this? Because it can be very dispiriting. I mean, we just saw today, I don't know how many of you saw the news, but Ann Coulter, who was due to give a speech out at the University of California, Berkeley had to cancel it, her sponsor withdrew because of the risk of violent protests. And let me be clear, those protests were directly organized to make sure she never got to say a word on that campus. It was clear and outright intimidation of a conservative speaker. So I think the first thing we need to do is just be aware that this is happening, and again, that it is not random. 
The intimidation game is very, very real. And again, as I said, it is the work of the same groups of politicians, the same groups of activist groups that are out there. If you look at the people who sent letters to the IRS demanding that they do something, if you look at the people who called in the Chamber of Commerce and run them over the coals in terms of how they spend their money and who their donors are, it's always the same senators. It's the same activist groups that are out there engaged in corporate proxy fights, trying to pressure companies to pass proxies that get them out of politics. It's always the same ones that are launching these same intimidation tactics against corporations that fund free market groups. So there's an organization out there, they know what they're doing. Again, they even have conferences about this stuff. Uh, and those conferences reach down even into the university level. There's an organization out there which is funded by unions and environmental groups called Uncoke My Campus. <laughs> They actually go out, they put out a, a, a manual, a handbook to student activists that give them step-by-step -step process to make sure to give them instructions on how they can uh, prevent and oppose any free market program that might come into existence on their campus. Of course, you don't have any of this happen against liberal donors or give money like Tom Steyer uh, to Stanford for you know, renewable energy programs of study, whatever, but this is a, a very real thing, same groups of people everywhere. We need to know who they are and what they're doing. I think we need to rethink and think very hard about how we limit the powers of the administrative state in a day and age in which the government is so large, in which that administrative state has so much power over so many aspects of our life, uh, in which they increasingly, too, are engaged in political decisions. I mean, a very good example, the IRS. The IRS needs to be stripped of the ability to make any political decisions about actors in elections, okay? They need to do what the IRS does best, which is to make sure that people cross their T's and dot their I's on their tax forms. And if somebody has a complaint about the actions of a nonprofit or a corporation, how they engage in an election, there's a very logical body that you should go to, the Federal Election Commission, which was actually set up to be a bipartisan group. There are six members, three Republicans, three Democrats. It takes four of them to make movement on uh, any uh, complaint that has been put in front of them. This is why the left doesn't like it, because often it results in a stalemate, and the FEC isn't nearly as aggressive as many would like them to be when it comes to campaign finance regulations. But this is the only fair and honest way to actually, and accountable way, to have a federal government <coughs> making decisions about speech and who's allowed to exercise it. At least the members of the Federal Election Commission are appointed by a president and confirmed by the Senate, and again, are accountable to the people. No one had ever heard Lois Lerner's name until after everything she had done came out. And there was no way to hold her accountable in the end. She is right now living on a full retirement and pension for the federal government and nothing has ever happened to her. So we need to make sure not just the IRS, but there are other agencies as well too, the Securities and Exchange Commission, Federal uh, uh, Communications Commission, look there's just too many alphabet letters out there in Washington, but all of them have taken actions in recent years as well that smack very much at the political targeting of opponents that they don't like, and we need to make sure the bureaucrats no longer have that power. I think we need to push corporations to grow some backbones and to be willing to defend more aggressively their free speech interests. Right now, too often, they leave it to other organizations or their trade organizations to defend them. We should be expecting CEOs to embrace this right that the Supreme Court has given them and proudly stand up for some of the things that they believe in, because they are things that many of us believe in, which is not just uh, democracy, but the capitalism that attends democracy as well, too. I think we do, in fact, need to completely overhaul our disclosure laws. Uh, and once again, put the onus of disclosure on government rather than citizens. Right now, anybody who gives more than $200 to a federal politician has their name and their address disclosed. And I don't mean to sound really cynical, but I can tell you, having worked in this city for a very long time, that there ain't no politician in this city that could be bought off for $200. <laughs> can you get a cup of coffee for $200? <laughs> so I think we need to think about those threshold limits. You know, what is a, what is a better number? Uh, $5,000, maybe $10,000. I 
I think we need to think about whether or not there really is a risk of corruption uh, in terms of ballot initiatives. Should we have to disclose the names of people who give money to ballot initiatives? Should we have to disclose the names of people who give money for issue ads? meaning those ads that run that are simply designed to educate the public on a certain issue rather than to expressly endorse uh, a politician or run against their reelection. Uh, those are called express ads and, and they're different. That's where there's potentially a corruption issue in terms of who's giving money to get someone elected and do they expect something in return. But a lot of these different areas uh, that have all been swept into the campaign finance field, I'm not necessarily sure there is a compelling reason for why average Americans' names need to be out there. Because again, we have people that are using disclosure as a weapon against them. I think most importantly, we need to call out intimidation in any form and in any manner we see it, and we need to do it instantly. There's one thing that I learned from writing this book. I interviewed about 60 different people that had all been targets of abuse like this. You know, and I expected to go and sort of have them feel victimized. And in fact, they were just this incredibly inspiring group of people that had all decided to stand up in the end and, and shout down the people who were, and, and, and oppose the people who were telling them that they couldn't take part in politics. And by and large, they all won those battles. It took some time, it was not easy in the end, and they suffered a lot of slings and arrows, but they were victorious. Because if we know one thing, bullies don't really like to be called out. Uh, they would rather operate in the shadows. Uh, and so a very good way to make sure that the intimidators do not win the day is to not be intimidated by them. And I think, as the last thing, conservatives also need to tamp down on their own impulse to copy these intimidation tactics. And it's a very easy thing to fall into. You look at the other side and some of the battles that they win and the tactics that they subject people to. I remember being very disheartened um, when Republicans, a couple of years ago, uh, after the Clinton Foundation came into the public arena again as part of the discussion, one of the first things that a number of House Republicans said is, we should get the IRS on this we should stick the IRS on them. Well, we just went through that. <laughs> we know how notorious the IRS can be. There are ways to, to look at the Clinton Foundation that don't involve, again, sticking federal bureaucracies on an organization. <clears throat> and we should not be scared, by the way, too, of competing voices and their voices. Because, in fact, we have better arguments. And our founding fathers, when they talked about speech, one of the reasons that they listed it first in the Bill of Rights is they understood that if you had free speech, you could not have tyranny. And that what they viewed as the right way for the United States going forward to set faction upon faction. Those were the words they used. They believed that more voices, more debate, more arguments was the way that we got a fuller and better democracy. And again, I think our side needs to embrace that uh, disown campaign finance laws, disown the tactics of others who would seek to silence that public debate and move forward from that. Anyway, I want to thank you all so much for your time tonight, and I believe I get to answer some questions if there are any, so thank you. take what other people can dish out. Um, you know, I've had plenty of people who have said mean things to me. I always like to laugh, though. I think when you stand up and you write about things like this and you talk about things like this, you inoculate yourself to a certain degree against the attacks. I mean, I keep laughing, and I don't want anybody repeat this, but I'm like, bring it on, IRS. Audit me. <laughs> See what I would write about that. Um, you know, in the wake of a book like I just wrote, 
Uh, but what worries me is that, look, if someone like me has the ability, I, I'm quite brave enough to come stand up here and write what I, the people that I worry about are those that are not always politically actively engaged. And they are the ones who are very concerned about what the blowback might be for these kind of attacks in their communities, at their schools. Look, one of the things that I say to people about disclosure that I think is really, really scary is that you don't know how it's being used against you. You know, let's say you go and interview for a job and you have a pretty good first interview and then you never get a call back. Is it because the person who interviewed went and looked up your political donations? Because they didn't want to hire someone that donated the way you did? Let's say your kid's a really good sports athlete, but he doesn't make the varsity team. Is it because the coach went and looked at the causes that your family gives to and decided that they take it? I mean, I've had that happen to me. I've had a coach who was really mean to a kid of mine, and at the very end of the season, informed me it was because he knew what I did and he hated what I did. I mean, my kid was five. <laughs> but, you know, people can find out what you do, and I think a lot of average Americans are very concerned about that. And it's why we do need to rethink some of this disclosure. So that, again, it's one thing if you're giving $50,000. Maybe there is a, a good cause. Even the really smart people I know that are campaign finance reformers, guys like Brad Smith, at the, uh, who used to be an FBC commissioner, is just brilliant on this stuff. Even he would not go so far as to get rid of sort of high dollar direct donations to politicians. He thinks that there isn't any corruption element to that and that is good government but we need to totally rethink the every aspect of the rest of the disclosure regime because it is scaring people out of taking part of politics yes sir tyler o'neill with pg media thanks again sure. so much for speaking uh, my question is on the cultural roots of where you see this kind of anger, this kind of intimidation, this bullying coming from. We have some people saying that we're in a post-Christian society and that the, you know, the religion doesn't have to enter into it. But the cultural animosity on both sides has been increasing in recent years, and they argue that there's more than just the left's anger and that this is a broad cultural problem. I think that's true, but that there's a precursor to it. And you know, the subtitle of the book is how the left is silencing free speech. And I was very careful to say that. I didn't say how liberals are or Democrats are. When I say the left, there is a political left in this country that's sort of a, an organization almost. And they wield enormous political power and that they they design, divine, sort of design these tactics and they filter down then through the grassroots and the troops. And, and I really do believe, as I said in the beginning of the speech, that as you have gone through the ages and they have lost the political argument in the country, at least in terms of support for their main policies and things, that their goal has been to simply stop other people from talking. Look, I think it's very important, and this got very much overlooked during the election, both Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders promised that one of their very first actions, if they became elected president, would be to pass an amendment to change Citizens United. In essence, that's how they like to put it. What they were in essence saying, if you looked at the text of this amendment, they wanted to allow the government to decide who could speak. They wanted to supersede James Madison and the First Amendment. I think that tells you everything you need to know about how much they fear speech. So I mean, this, is, this is what they were advocating. So they start, but then it trickles down. And then increasingly you have people who say, uh, well, you know, I'm told that I don't have to put up with this kind of speech anymore. Um, and then you have a reaction on the other side saying, you can't impose, and, and there is a cultural aspect of this, political correctness, which also came out of the political left as well too, and you see a reaction to that now, of people saying, I can say whatever I want, and you can't stop me. And I think what everyone's forgotten along the way is courtesy, civil debate, and conversation, which would be a useful thing. I, I went to go speak at college on this subject, and thankfully nobody protested me or rioted me, I'm not very important, so it was okay. Um, but um, I had a, a woman, and she came, and she clearly disagreed with the subject of the talk, and, and she put her hand up in the end, she goes, you know, 
the First Amendment does not give you the right to hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, actually, honey, I'm sorry, but it does. It does give me, like, uh, now, there's a bigger question about whether or not I should hurt your feelings, okay? And we should all strive to be good human beings and have polite civil discourse and good debate and be courteous of each other. But if you're really looking at it from a legal and constitutional view, yes, I absolutely have the right to hurt your feelings. Um, and that gets to one other thing just because we're talking about culture. We need better universities who are standing up for the right of free speech. We need a safe zone for free speech in every university in this country. And I think that that's not going to happen until parents get involved until parents also say, I'm not giving you $40,000 a year until you get rid of the speech codes on your campus and until you make sure that kids who violently riot uh, are expelled because that's bad behavior and your fellow students should be subject to that. They're there to learn and have debates and have an open society. Yes, sir. Hi. Thanks for speaking tonight. It's a really great presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned uh, about the, the impact of social media. And let me give you an example. Uh, I follow Prager University pretty routinely. They're, they're really a, a good outfit, I think, and they present really good presentations. And what, what they're finding is, is YouTube is now shutting down their videos. I, I would like to know your thoughts about how pervasive this is and, and what, what rights do we have to, to, to overcome this kind of uh, shutting down by, by left-leaning um, media organizations. So I have a personal story on this. I did a Prager U. If, if nobody knows what Prager University is, go home, sign up for it right away. By the way, speaking of, go home and sign up for it in Primus as well, too, Hillsdale Speech Digest. Uh, but Prager U, put on by Dennis Prager out in California, his radio talk show host, he does these marvelous, he gets really qualified people who are experts on their subject. They do these four or five minute videos on, on a different area, all kind of from a free market, uh, constitutional conservative perspective. He deliberately makes these uh, as a way for younger, like for college students to learn about these subjects too, things that they might not otherwise use in the university. So it has been incredibly uh, ironic that YouTube has been imposing parental controls on PragerU's uh, videos. And I think 19 of them at the moment are put into these parental controls. So if you're a parent and you've got parental controls on your computer, your kids cannot access these PragerU videos, which by the way are done with kids in mind. So if they don't have any bad language, they don't have any, you know, anything that would really be too emotionally sensitive. Personal story, I did a PragerU video about the book and about the threats of silencing free speech and PragerU censored it. I mean, and, and YouTube censored it. So they censored my video on free speech. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, the editorial page, decided to call and find out what was going on with this. And it was really interesting. I got this whole song and dance from a YouTube executive about how none of this is done by humans. It's all some computer algorithm. And they just, you know, it's just a computer does it. And we don't know. But interestingly enough, about an hour and a half after I called, my video had been moved off the censorship list. Then it went back on, went back on, and then it came back off again. In terms of what we do, this is a big problem because you're not seeing it just on uh, you know, YouTube, obviously Facebook had its big summit with conservatives because of concerns about the ways in which certain bits of social media were getting censored in different forms. I'm not entirely sure what the answer to this is. These are private companies and I respect the rights of private companies to do some things as they choose. I think that obviously your number one option is to not use it. That becomes increasingly difficult in a day and age where everything is done on Twitter and Facebook and there is only one outlet. I suppose we can hope that there might be competitive outlets for such things. Some people are trying to do that. I've heard a, an idea going around of, of suggesting that maybe social media needs to be treated the way broadcast is and uh, subject to all kinds of rules and limits. I'm not quite sure I'm a big fan of that either. Um, but it is a very alarming, and I wish I had a better answer at the moment. I don't, but you, I, I would argue that this is one of the bigger concerns out there at the moment. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Pat, Pat Gibson, Pat, um, I read your articles. Oh, thank you. 
on John Doe investigations in uh, Wisconsin with horror. Yeah, and it's horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. And I'm curious as a follow up, was there any follow up out of that? Was there any outcome? Was there any, did they ever help accountable? No, it's amazing. Not only was there no follow up, no accountability, but the special prosecutors involved there are still trying to go after these herbs. You know, the Supreme Court shut them down, and now they've been trying to bring suits to complain about the people who leaked. There has actually been a discussion about whether or not, you know, they can get the people who leaked it in the end. I mean, look, the whole point was the Supreme Court said, you can't believe you imposed a gag order on people that you were prosecuting. The, the state legislature has since reformed that John Doe law because it was so egregiously abused in this case. But that brings up another thing that I think we have to think about, especially from the prosecutorial realm, is some way that we do hold some of the perpetrators of this intimidation responsible for their acts. I mean, the Lois Lerner story was absolutely appalling because the, the House actually did um, pass a resolution suggesting that she be prosecuted for giving uh, false testimony in front of the House. They sent it to a, a, an attorney who'd been appointed by Obama. He sat on it, he did nothing. The last day before he resigned, he said he would not act on it and dismissed it. So there has been no way to hold her accountable. The FBI investigation into this was, the Justice Department investigation was uh, a ruse. It didn't really happen in the end. And we have prosecutors out there who are doing in Wisconsin, what they did in Wisconsin, in other states now. There was a Montana legislator who lost his job because of a, a similar phony campaign finance probe into his work that was launched by his political opponents and ended up uh, kicking him out of the Montana legislature in the end. So this is being replicated, and I think we need to either have put pressure on professional bodies, for instance, bar associations, to, to look at some of the actions of these people, or simply, uh, look as part of our stripping of federal employees and their rights uh, or, and, and their ability to engage in some of this political prosecution also includes some penalties for those that are found to have behaved in a way that rob Americans of their constitutional rights. Yes, sir. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, so many of the, uh, the methods of intimidation that you identified rely on state agencies yes. and state power. Given that now we have the federal government and Congress and ostensibly the Supreme Court in uh, right-leaning hands, uh, I, you know, for the sake of devil's advocate, if I were a leftist, would I, should I suddenly be concerned that maybe these, these methods will be turned against me and perhaps I would deserve it, but that would be probably a more principled stance than that. So what, what, how does your analysis given the political reality that has just happened. Well, that's why I throw again, I think that conservatives need to be very cautious of not turning around and using and abusing any of these powers on the other side, even though it might be very tempting to do so. That being said, I think that uh, if, that there was a liberal who was asking me about how concerned they should be about this. I would point out to them that it's not very likely that the federal government, federal bureaucracy of the United States will aid Donald Trump <laughs> in going after any of his enemies. I mean, it, it is much easier, and this is just a case for a Democratic president with a left-leaning federal bureaucracy to blow that dog whistle and get what they need than it is for a Republican. You, I can promise you that if this president attempted to get any federal bureaucracy to do any such things, the whistleblowing people would be lining up like outside of buildings to whistleblow on this president. It wouldn't last more than 35 seconds. Um, so I think that's a natural guard uh, against him. There's a bigger risk, um, Department of Justice, other agencies that are very much run by the political leadership at the top and have more uh, discretion to focus their attention on certain types of actions or certain groups, for instance. That being said, I think Jeff Sessions is a very honorable guy who's gonna try to, one thing, again, that liberals have going for them is that conservatives do believe in the idea of law and order. <laughs> do believe in the idea of constitutional restraint, um, and, and that works to the left's advantage in all of these cases. Anybody else? Yes, sir. One, one last question. Right. Sort of following up on that previous remark, 
you know, the tactics they're using, the left are using, are, are really base and immoral. I mean, they're right out of Paul Alinsky, essentially. Yes. You know, he pledged his troth to Satan, I believe, in the core of his book. So, um, we're sort of a different breed of cat. But the question I have is, um, what, how many of our fellow Americans are, are you know, devolved to that level of, of, of really street fighting? I mean, is it a small percentage? You know, it seems like some of these things, half the country, almost half. But is it, what you're taking on? I mean, it is, it's such a high percentage of our fellow citizens who really don't believe in right and wrong, essentially. Um, what, what, how can we have a nation under law that we would know? Can, 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 our, can our nation survive? And, and I think we guys would know that. Well, first of all, I would point out, with regards to the tactics, one of the things I try really hard to do in the book, and I want to draw a, just a very strong distinction here, is I have no problem with people protesting things or speaking out. That is part of debate as well. It's part of civil society and, and again, that faction versus faction model that the founding fathers believed in. And I encourage people to say when they disagree. I think what's important about the examples in the book is that they were using federal power, prosecutorial power, or other tactics that were designed. Uh, uh, there were abuses of power. That's the dividing line. Um, and also tactics that threaten violence, for instance. Um, again, I have no problem with Berkeley students going out and peacefully holding a sign and say that they you know, don't agree with Ann Coulter but rioting and burning cars and, and hurting speakers is not acceptable uh, and is pure intimidation. Here's, I think, a hopeful thing. I don't actually think it's hugely widespread. I think you have a, a political leadership at the top and activist groups that are involved, that are engaged in this, and they're setting the tone uh, in a way that is easy for some unthinking people like college students to follow. But one of the things, did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> you don't have a right to hurt my feelings. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that was actually really encouraging in the book is, I told you that story about Dick Durbin sending that letter out to all of the organizations that had supported ALEC um, and demanding that they come in um, to Washington and account for themselves. And it was very hard to When he did that, nearly every one of his home state papers, including liberal newspapers, condemned him. They ran an editorial saying, you know, Durbin's enemies list, and this is not appropriate, and you do not get to use the power of the dais to scare organizations out of their giving and who they give money to. I think the average American, whether right of center, left of center, if they're not committed sort of partisans, they get the First Amendment. And if they're not under the age of 25, they get the First Amendment and understand the importance of free speech and the rights of people to say things that are even unpopular. Um, and that they will rally to that idea. Now, I could just be an optimist in this. I am a conservative, so I am born an optimist. But I really do. Uh, my reporting and the time I spent out there um, was very heartening that way. And I think, too, that as these tactics have become worse, you also see some organizations that are getting concerned about this. Ones that, that certainly fall on the, the liberal left or on the conservative right, but you know, I've seen organizations like the NAACP and some other groups realize that one of the risks of all of this sort of government abuse is that it could get turned on them in the end, and that maybe they need to go back to their roots of supporting uh, free speech and all of its manifestations. Thank you all so much.